Hi, welcome to lecture 15 and this is going to look at the maximum likelihood estimation method. How do we decide what's the best fitting model for uh, a set of data? So you can select the sort of model you want to use but how can we pick the best parameters? The parameters which give the maximum likelihood um, of representing the data that we have. I'm going to do that. We're going to look at the coefficient of determination and then do a significance test on that to decide whether or not it is a good enough uh, model for the data. I'm going to take an example <coughs> where we're looking at the yield of a process and how that changes with temperature. Obviously we can calculate the mean and unbiased standard deviation and we can plot our data and there's the mean. So what do we think? Looks like there might be a trend going on as temperature increases, so does yield. If you're trying to model this data, you want to do it in a simpler way as possible. There's no benefit from selecting a model which might have zero error, but doesn't physically represent the system in any way, because then if you interpolate between values, you're likely to find errors. So here, for example, it's unlikely that the model represents actually what would happen. So a model wants to be as simple as possible um, and as sophisticated as necessary to represent the key aspects of the what the data shows. So if you can fit it with a straight line, then that's normally best. Um, it, uh, a linear model enables much more analysis to be done um, and offers some good solutions. Uh, if you're fitting a linear model or any model, you have to be careful not to extrapolate outside of the range which it's been fitted to because you don't know what happens to your parameters outside that range. That's uh, an assumption. Okay, uh, we know about the covariance and for this data we can calculate the covariance. And of course the covariance has units, 17.5 degrees C tons per hour. And so that tells us something about the um, uh, relationship of x's to y's and whether they're moving in the same direction. Um, but it's hard to interpret that because it's uh, very specific to the particular data we have. So the correlation coefficient, uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient, divides that by the uh, standard deviations um, and it normalizes it into a value that is standardized between minus one and one. And we note that if we're using the unbiased definition for the covariance, we should then use the unbiased definition for our standard deviations. It doesn't matter which you use, if you use the biased versions you'll get the same value because they cancel out, you just have to use the same for both. Okay, so is that a good value? It's suggestive that there is a correlation taking place, um, but is it significant? And so we need to use our R test to find that out. So we find our value of our test. We've got 5 minus 2 degrees of freedom, not very many. And um, we put in our value of R, get 2.78. Okay, so with a T distribution, it's a two sided test because we can be either side of the hypothesis that um, there is no correlation. And at a 5% level of significance, the critical value is 3.18. Now, since 2.78 is less than 3.18, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. And so we conclude, actually, there is no evidence of a relationship between yield and temperature. So despite it looking like there might be a correlation with this number of data points, actually, uh, we're 95% sure that there, there isn't. And if you look at the data and consider it actually, you think, well, if this one data point happened to be lower down here, you can see how much scatter there is. There's plenty of scatter. And if that happened to be a bit lower or if that one happened to be a bit higher, then you'd be looking at it and thinking, actually, there's very little sign of a correlation there. So that's useful to see. So first impressions can be deceptive in that regard. But let's carry on anyway. Uh, let's foolishly carry on and see how can we put a model to it and then see what happens at the end of that process. So we've decided to fit a linear model to it. It seems to be a, a simple model that seems to follow the data fairly well for what that's worth. Uh, so we'll follow our analysis of this. So to fit a model, we need to define our model. So here's our model definition. We're representing our um, 
values as alpha plus beta xi. So for each xi, we're calculating a predicted value of yi. So the actual value of yi is going to be equal to the predicted value plus some error. So how do we choose alpha and beta in order to maximize the likelihood? So if we consider the probability density, uh, probability distribution function for yi given these terms, we're saying that each uh, value of y is um, a probability distribution function. Uh, it has a mean value um, and it has um, a variance around it. And it's normally distributed, so we have the equation of this form, a normal distribution. And here's our value and here's our estimate. And we want to maximize the probability. We want to um, select alpha and beta such that we're maximizing this expression. But we're not just doing it for one value of y, we're doing it for all the values of y. So the probability of getting all the values of y, given all the values of x, alpha, beta and sigma, uh, these are now vectors, so all the values of y, all the values of x. Uh, well, it's the probability of one occurrence multiplied by the probability of the next and the next and the next. So we've got a product term here. So we've got the product of all the individual um, f's. Now we want to maximize the probability. This is our um, likelihood estimator. And we want to make this as, as likely as possible. We want to make it as likely as possible that we um, are representing our data with the model. Um, and you can do that by taking logs of each side, and that makes the analysis much easier. Uh, the log of the product is equal to the sum of the logs of the individual terms within it. <clears throat> and then we substitute in our expression for f. And again, we can do some more work on that. Um, so log of a times b is equal to log a times log b. And then you take log of the exponential, and obviously they cancel. So we've got log of this term minus the um, exponential index term. And furthermore, we can say that uh, summing this, this is a constant, so we can sum that term. And then we can take 1 over 2 sigma squared out, a constant again, and we're summing this term. This is what we want to maximize. So to maximize this, when this is a constant, that means minimizing this term here. If we can make that smaller, then this term would be bigger. So we want to minimize this term in particular. And here we get to the point where we can see why it's called least squares fitting, because this is our error squared, and we're trying to minimize it. So that's why we use that method. To minimize it, we can simply differentiate it partially with respect to alpha and beta and set it to equal to zero. And then you can see we're getting a pair of simultaneous equations with two unknowns, alpha and beta, and that's what we need to solve for. Now, we can solve these equations um, quite simply, uh, and we can just make the notation easier by giving symbols for the summations. You see here we've got a summation of yi, a summation of xi, a summation of xi, yi, and so on. So what we do is we give each of those summations a name. So sy is the summation of the yi's, sx is the summation of the xi's, and so on. And then these are the same simultaneous equations just written down using uh, these symbols to represent the summations. And then you can see how we can manipulate them. If we multiply the top equation by sxx, uh, then we've got these two terms here, which will cancel when we add them and that eliminates beta. So now we have an expression just for alpha, and we can rearrange that. And here we have an expression for alpha, and this is the alpha which will minimize our sum of um, squared errors, and therefore will maximize the, um, uh, the uh, um, likelihood that our model fits.
So once we have alpha, we can then substitute that back in to get an expression for beta like that. Now you've probably seen these types of equations before to fit an, uh, a gradient, to fit an intercept, um, but now you can see the method by which they were derived. And by knowing the method that was used, you can then change that method if you need to for a different situation. So for our example, we put in our numbers and we get alpha is minus 1.7, we get beta is 0 0.0700, that's the gradient. And we can plot that line. So that's the best fit line. And of course, Excel will do that for you automatically if you want. Um, Excel has a linest function. If you want to calculate these parameters, um, you can do that automatically using linest and extracting the appropriate um, numbers that are returned. Um, but knowing how it works uh, is a good starting point. And of course, um, that shows the line passing through the intercept. Uh, and of course, we don't probably want to use that region of the graph because we um, are extrapolating outside of our data range. OK, so you've got done that. You've done a um, linear fit. Great. Uh, it asks, begs the question of how well does the model fit? So one way to quantify how well the model fits is to calculate the coefficient of determination. And this is equal to 1 minus the ratio of, this is the error squared summed, um, and that's the sum of the deviation of the y's from the mean y squared. That's called the coefficient of determination. And it's a number that must be between 0 and 1. If it's 0, there's no fit. And if it's 1, it's a perfect fit. And in the special case of linear least squares regression with an intercept turn, then the coefficient of determination r squared is equal to the square of the Pearson uh, correlation coefficient. Uh, that, not, uh, that is not always true for other types of model. So in our case, our r squared is 0 0.72. And you could say that that means the model accounts for about 72% of the variability found in the data. But a large value of r squared doesn't necessarily mean you have a good model. Uh, for various reasons, but it's an indicator of uh, how much the uh, model represents the variability in the data. So the final thing then is to take uh, our R squared and to um, to think what's the significance test for our regression? Can we actually come up with a, an answer for whether this is a good model or not? And so here we have uh, hypothesis. This hypothesis, the null hypothesis, says that beta is equal to zero. So that means actually there is no um, correlation between the data. Uh, and here beta isn't zero. So that would mean that our model is good. So if, if H0 is uh, is rejected, then that means that um, our model is good. There should be a, um, a beta value for our model. And to do that, we use this F test parameter. And you can recognize some of these terms, yi minus y. So that's the deviations of the y points away from the mean squared. And this is the error squared summed. n minus 2 is a degree of freedom. And to find that, we need to find it. Uh, we can take a 5% level of significance. Um, we have our value of f test. And that would be rejected if our value of f test is greater than this um, critical value f. And f is taken from tables of f distribution. It's a one-sided test. A table of f distribution looks like this. That's what the f function looks like. We're interested in having a 5% probability in there. Um, we've got um, <coughs> this uh, matrix because our value of f has uh, three indices. 0 0.05 says the significance level, so that's represented by these numbers here. One represents the column. Uh, so the first number one represents the column, and three represents the row. Three comes from our degrees of freedom. Five minus two is three. And so we can read off our value. Here is 10.13 is our critical value. There it is. So our test value was 7.73. F critical value is 10.13. And so our value is smaller than the critical value. So H naught is not rejected. So that means that the linear model does not adequately describe the relationship between the variables. 
Uh, well, that's disappointing, but actually we knew that was going to happen because we'd already tested the correlation at the beginning of this and found that uh, the data was not significantly correlated. So we've finished that lecture, we've done linear regression, we've done the derivation of the method, and we've seen why least squares fitting, minimizing the least square, uh, sorry, minimizing the sum of the squares of the errors is a good method for fitting a model to data. We've done it for the linear case, but you could do that for any model. You can sum the squares of the errors and minimize them, and that will give you the best fitting models for your data, and we proved why that is. We looked at the coefficient of determination and shown that we can test for uh, regression uh, or test for whatever model we're using and test whether that model adequately represents the data. Okay, our final lecture will be next, 16, and here we're going to look at the extension of the maximum likelihood estimator and look at the application of error propagation within it. So we're going to take a different example, constrained least squares fitting, so that's where uh, there is no intercept, the line has to go through the origin. And so that's different from the case that you've seen before. So we can see how by starting uh, with the derivation we can change the nature of our model and then work through the derivation again to fit um, any sort of model that we want. And then we're looking at error propagation as we do that and we can see that we can propagate the uncertainty in our data values into an uncertainty into the gradient and an uncertainty into our intercept values.